This is Join Us in France, episode 313. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and today I bring you a conversation with Elise about egg morte. So that would be egg mort in English, I think. It's in the Camargue, Camargue. And we also talk about Saint Louis, a very strange French king, but you've heard of him because he's the one who went to the Crusades, brought back the crown of thorns, and gave us the Sainte Chapelle in Paris. This particular king you got to know he is he was a little weird <laughs> he wanted to liberate the holy land which of course did not belong to us and he wanted to um <laughs> tamp down muslims who I, as far as i know hadn't done us any wrong and to do that he wanted to build a city from scratch well pretty much from scratch as elise will explain uh, whereas he could have been using other ports on the mediterranean so he was a little bit of a yeah, interesting guy. Uh, <laughs> but it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, fortified city today and a, a lovely place to visit. If you're visiting the Montpellier area, it's great for one or two days. And um, well, well, Elise and I think so anyway. My new cookbook, Join Us at the Table, is now available in print as well as as an ebook on Amazon. Lots of listeners and fans have been asking me for the paper book. I knew it would take some time and it did take a lot of work. I was hoping that it would be available by December 15th and check it out. It's November 29th and it's already available in print. I'm really tickled about that. Thank you listeners for making it a number one bestseller for several days in a row. Number one in French cooking, number one in French travel, and it's now number one in new releases. It's been a lot of work and it's so good to see the book do so well. I know that all these number one tags, the best in this, the best in that, they won't last because, you know, I'm not Barack Obama, (laughs) but uh, it was great to have them for a while and to see the book do well. Thank you for your reviews as well. They are wonderful. And I love to see your photos of the recipes you've made from the book on social media. It's wonderful for me to inspire you to do some classic French cooking at home. Many of you said, you know, I bought it as an ebook. It's wonderful. I like it so much. I want to give it as a Christmas gift, as a printed book. So my recommendation is that you do that as soon as you can, because in these days of COVID, print on demand is slower than normal. So I ordered some for, for me to give as Christmas gifts for my family, and they'll be here by Christmas, but it'll probably take two or possibly three weeks. So I really recommend that you order the print book now if that's what you intend to do. I'll put a note uh, to join us at the table in the show notes, or you can search, you know, join us at the table on Amazon. And I have a question for you this week. This is, this has to do with the next book I'm going to write. So I I would like to know, uh, when we're able to travel freely again, where in France do you want to go? Just name one city or one area. I, I have a feeling most of you will say Paris, <laughs> but I'm curious. Email me, Annie, at joinusinfrance.com or post it on the Facebook group. Thank you, patrons, for giving me a precious gift, the time to produce this podcast. Your monthly gift makes it all possible. And in these times of great uncertainty and anxiety, I cannot tell you how much it means to me. A shout out to new patrons and more info on how to join my wonderful patrons after the interview. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash the number 313, where you can see a recap of what we've discussed and also follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see my photos of Egg Morte. I'll post them this week. And of course, the best way to stay in touch with me and with the podcast is to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. <laughs> Bonjour Elise. 
Bonjour, Annie. So today we are recording in a different way. I'm calling you over the phone. I finally figured out how to record over the phone. It only took me six years. It only took you six years. You know, this is very <laughs> strange to not be able to see you at all. This is that's, like a disembodied voice yes, that's floating yes. out there. Well, to, tomorrow know? they're lifting some restrictions, but right. you know, so that'll be that'll be nice. But I, I just want everybody to know that we're being very compliant with the rules <laughs> due to yes, COVID nineteen. We are. We are. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and and for those of you out there who saw the wonderful photo that Annie posted on Facebook of the two of us, it really, really was the only time that we've met since the beginning of the confinement. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it was just, a great idea, though. It, it really just happened was. to go out to. I mean, I called her and we talked, and she, she says, "I'm going to the store." I'm like, "Oh, I need to go to the store too. Why don't we go at the same time?" <laughs> There you are. I thought, yeah. what a way. I mean, it never dawned on me before to try to do that. You know, it's yeah. the sneakiest way to try and see some friends, you know. But <laughs> anyway, today uh, we're going to talk about Egemort and the famous French qu king who gave us the Sainte Chapelle, uh, yes. Saint Louis. Saint Louis. But before exactly. we get to that, I want to ask you about your Patreon and how things are going there. Well, uh, things are creeping along at a snail's pace, and I guess part of it, of course, is the fact that because of the confinement, I really haven't been able to do uh, any new episodes since I posted the last one, which, of course, I record at your house. I would like to give a shout-out, a really thank, big thank you to Jonathan, who uh, signed up and very was very generous in his, in his uh, patronage. And I would just like to encourage some other people out there, if you like the podcast that I do with Annie, uh, do remember that it is one way of showing it is to just participate with a tiny little bit uh, in the patronage on Patreon, because these are a bit of hard times for us guides. Yeah. So uh, to sign up for Elise's, to be Elise's patron, you go to Patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com forward slash Elise Art. And that's E L Y S A R T. Yeah? Yep. Yeah, I got it right. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, that is me. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And I would just like to add uh, to say uh, kudos to Annie with the huge success that she is uh, having with her online cookbook and. Uh, Having eaten a lot of the food, I just can only say it's really great. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and speaking of the cookbook, I need to explain something. There's a few people who've said, I don't own a Kindle, so I can't download your cookbook. And I want to make it clear that you don't need to have a Kindle device to get a Kindle book. You can open a Kindle book on your tablet, on your smartphone, even on your computer. All you yeah. have to do is install the Kindle app, just exactly. like any app for any other uh, thing that you want to do. So just, just wanted to make, mention that because it seems some people don't uh, haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. But that is a fact. Uh, you can just download the Kindle app. It's so easy to do. Right. And this episode is coming out on Sunday. Uh, we're working on um, the print book still. That print book is going to drive us batty. But hopefully it won't be long now. Hopefully. <laughs> Let's hopefully, yeah. hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Right. All right. So, Egg Mocht, oh, and, and the cookbook is called Join Us at the Table, and you can find it on Amazon. I need to say that. Uh, Egg Mocht and Saint Louis. Okay. Let's talk Egg about it. Beautiful place. So, uh, Egg Mocht. Egg Mocht uh, uh, is uh, a walled in town, actually. It is still a uh, totally uh, walled in town with, with ramparts that is situated in uh, an area that is actually called uh, the Petite Camargue, or the Little Camargue. And that is the marshland that is the delta of the Rhone River, which is, of course, the extreme south of France. Uh, Aigues there are two cities in the Camargue. We will talk more about the Camargue in, in another podcast because there's a lot of other things to, to say about the region. Um, it is not, France has no tropical zones, you know, so this is still Mediterranean climate, but <clears throat> the Camargue is actually a huge, huge delta, so it's, it's really marshland. And uh, in this zone, there uh, is a part that's called the Petit Camargue, which is uh, more or less on the western side 
<clears throat> a little bit further away from the, where, where the road empties out, which is which is closer to to Marseille. And for a very very long time, uh, it was just an area that was filled, as you can imagine, with uh, mosquitoes and very poor people <laughs> who were sort of eking out their their existence with it. Uh, and with the only thing being available to them was really the the salt that was was uh, gathered up in, in the area. Yeah. Uh, lots of grasslands and things like that. And then what happened was that uh, there were a few little settlements. I mean, there, amazingly, in, in the history of France, little settlements everywhere since the beginning of time. But uh, if we go to the Middle Ages, uh, we get to the period that we've talked about a lot in lots of different podcasts, which is really the period of the 1100s and the 1200s and some of the glorious very famous kings of France, and one that we have actually talked about before because we've talked about him in relation to the Saint-Chapelle, which I'm sure many of you know about having visited Paris. And um, also there, there's something else that I'll mention a little bit later about him. But this is uh, the king who was actually Louis the Ninth, Yeah. And Louis the Ninth uh, became Saint Louis, uh, which is why there's a St. Louis in Missouri in the United States. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's named after him. This is why there are St. Louis. There are St. Louis a little bit everywhere. Canada has a whole bunch of them, I think. You know, and uh, uh, he was king uh, for 43 years, which, considering the times, was an enormously long time. Yeah. But you have to know that he became king at the age of 12. Uh, yeah. So, Wow. That, that, you know, he wasn't, in those days, you were considered adult for a man at the age of 14. So, uh, actually, for two years, he was, uh, the, he was king in waiting, if you want to call it that. And it was his mother, uh, who, who basically ruled. But, but he is considered to officially have been king for 43 years. And he was, as some of you may already know, an extremely religious and extremely pious king. And it was, in fact, for that reason that he brought back uh, the crown of thorns to uh, France and made uh, Saint-Chapelle. And <clears throat> later on in his king career, if you want to call it that, <laughs> um, he, he decided to go on a, a, another crusade. He had already been on a couple of crusades. Uh, and uh, But what happened was that as he was getting a little bit older, he uh, decided that he wanted to create and organize another crusade, and that became what is known as the Seventh Crusade. There were in total actually eight, mm -hmm. uh, but during the Seventh crusade, crusade. And what happened was that... In past times, to go on a crusade, he'd had to rely on the ports on the Italian coast, especially in the northern part, ah. uh, before before he got down to Sicily, which was governed uh, for a very long time by brothers of the French kings. So even though we think of Sicily as being Italian, it actually has a very long history of being attached to the French uh, kingdom. And he got tired of having to pay the price of the Italian uh, maritime ports and I'm sure a certain amount of ransom because in those days uh, nothing was, was straight up anyway. And uh, so what he did was he organized the development and the building of this town that is called Aigues Mort. Uh, it was literally uh, built pretty much from scratch under his supervision and the reason he did it, even though it doesn't open absolutely directly onto the waters of the Mediterranean, it's close enough that having built two or three canals coming out of it, that they could actually gather together there and ship out from there onto the sea and bypass completely the Italian coast. Mm. <clears throat> and one of the things that's really interesting is that the exact placement of it is because... And this is this is where it all gets to be so mind blowing for me. Uh, the exact placement is because there was a tower that was already there. Yeah. That had been built by Charlemagne. 
Charlemagne? Yeah, Charlemagne. In <laughs> 790. In 790. Could you get... I mean, this is like really... Long, long time before, yeah. Uh, we're talking a long time ago. I mean, this is way before my time. Really, it really is. You know, I mean, it's, it's, really, I'm starting to feel old, but my God, this is really way before my time. Um, and because uh, Charlemagne had actually built a tower that was 33 meters high uh, as a lookout tower, can you imagine? I mean, this is what we're talking about in the 8th century, uh, 8th and 9th century, to, to make sure uh, that there were no invasions coming up from this area. It's very interesting because, aside, um, excuse me for making this kind of like an aside, but thinking about even World War II and the fact that um, the weakness of lots of uh, attacking armies has always been to assume that people are not going to come up into France from that area. And mm. that is one of the things that happened in World War II as, as well. Yeah. So... Uh, so what happened was that having had this tower there basically gave uh, uh, Louis, uh, Louis IX uh, the idea of the placement for this city. And so what he did was he had these workers go down and dredge the area. They had to dry out some of it. They actually constructed a couple of canals, mm. and they built this walled, reinforced uh, city. And the name of it, Aigues Mortes, it simply means in old French and, of course, in, in uh, uh, Occitan as well, it means stagnant waters right. is what it means. Um, you can actually translate it as dead waters, but yeah. if you can figure out that what that means is it's, you can yeah. imagine what we're talking about. It's a really huge marsh, marshland zone. It's the bayou. <laughs> It's 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 a bayou, yeah. Except you know, I was thinking about that. So Louisiana is really subtropical. I mean, it's not considered. It's interesting because Louisiana and parts of Florida are uh, as close as you get to the tropics in the United States. Mm -hmm. They're sub, they're called technically subtropical, which means they have some of the stuff like that's icky, like you know, lots of alligators and, right. and stuff like that. No alligators know, then, in in the Camargue. Right, there are no alligators in the Camargue. <laughs> no, no, no. So, you know, it, it's, but it is definitely marshland. Uh, and it, so just as a, as a way to situate it for people who have never really visited that area, it is 35 kilometers from Nîmes. Yeah. And it is 30 kilometers from Montpellier. Yeah. Which really is not that far. I mean, that means it's no. 20 miles from Montpellier. And uh, it's really easy to get to because now, of course, there are roads uh, that, that go there. Yeah. So uh, at the time... Um, they they simply created a few canals. Uh, right. Now, uh, so what happened was the first tower, the tower that was built by Charlemagne, was called the Matafer Tower, and it existed up until the time that uh, Louis started building Aigues Mort. Interestingly enough, so it, it lasted for a very long time. Uh, it, I'm not sure, to be very honest, exactly when it was destroyed. But it was destroyed about that time because what happened was that when he began the building of a Mort, he built a tower. I don't know if it's exactly on his foundation or just next to it, but the tower is called the Tower of Constance, mm. and that is still there. Mm. And it, it was also a it was a lookout tower, but it also became a prison because that was very useful to have as, as at the time as well. Uh, and it, it's a tower that is 30 meters high, and the walls are six meters thick. Can mm. you imagine? Yeah, it's it's six meters thick. Yeah. So um, we're in the year 1240. Yeah. And he has decided that he wants to go on this new crusade. And uh, as I, I was just mentioning to you, having just gone back online to, to take a look at it, um, really fascinating. I think in my mind, and maybe in many people's minds, uh, crusades were always just about retaking Jerusalem, uh, the holy yeah. city. But in fact, this particular crusade was not. It was to attack Egypt. Huh. Uh, uh, which was an extremely powerful country with an emir and a, a dynasty of emirs. And they basically ruled the area, including a good part of uh, what would now be considered to be Israel, Jordan, and, and Lebanon. Hmm. So the, uh, the, the, the purpose of this attack was, in fact, not directly to go as far as uh, the, the coast of what would be Palestine at the time, but to actually land uh, in Egypt. 
So he needed to have a place to leave from, and they worked on embarking from Egmort. It took, of course, several years uh, to make sure that the city was built. They could have used Marseille, um, but, and this is why the it's Middle East... It's far. Ages Marseille ended. is far. Marseille is far, but they could have used it. But So this is why I find that the Middle Ages, it's actually kind of interesting, but also very confusing. It was controlled by his one of his brothers. He had a bunch of brothers. And, of course, they were all princes or counts. And his brother was Charles d'Anjou, who was the Count of Provence. And uh, he... he, he even though it was his brother, he wanted to make him pay if he was going to leave from Marseille. Okay, it was like Jeez. this. This is like a money making venture. It's like, hey guys, <laughs> you want to leave from here? You better pay me good money for this, you know. So uh, he kind of went, never mind. I'm going to find a way of doing this without having to go through all of this shit with my I brother's see. excuse the language. You know, he also had another brother. Um, who who was count of another part of the coastline, and um, he had another brother who, in fact, was made king of Aragon, and none of them actually wanted to help him, which is really interesting. So yeah. you kind of wonder what the internal politics were at the time, what they were doing. Uh, so Aigmore, uh eventually was built. It, it 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 it's really fascinating because it exists today in exactly the form in which it was finished. That is, it's a totally flat, uh, entirely surrounded by uh, these medieval ramparts. The tower, of course, is still there. And uh, now, of course, it's a very interesting tourist destination with uh, lots of crafts and lots of little shops and things like that. Yeah. But what's amazing is, is as you drive up close to it, it's rather imposing because here in the middle of what amazed really basically is nothing. I mean, it's just this, you know, it, it's grasslands uh, all the way around it. Uh, you have this entire walled city, uh, mm -hmm. and it's basically stayed the same uh, ever since, except that, of course, now there are paved roads that, that go right up to it. There's a second tower that was built. The tower is called the Carbonier Tower, and it is uh, one of the entrances to uh, Aigmort, and it is also where... A little bit later, after uh, Louis the Ninth died, his grandson Philippe the Bel, uh, or the Philippe the Beautiful, or the Handsome, who was also uh, very interesting and a bit nasty as a king, <laughs> it was in Aigmort and in front of this tower that he burned the Knights Templar, right? Who uh, uh, were were a, a very very interesting group of people and. That makes me think, Annie, we should do a, a podcast about them one of these days. That would be very interesting, uh, yes. It would be very interesting. So, and it's, and so. it's interesting to, see, to say also that the, the style of chateaus, of castles, has evolved over time. If you yes. think, if you ask a kid to draw a castle, you know, with, with the towers and the ramparts and stuff, it's about, that's what Egmort looks like. It's your 1200s, you know, that's the image we have in our heads is from the 1200s. So it's, it's, it's you know, the, 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 the walls with the towers every now and then and the, and the gates to enter and that sort of thing. Exactly. You know, and, and what's called the crenellation, you know, the, the kind of in and out dentation that's up on the top, which of course is like in Carcassonne, which is a piece was used so that the, the, the soldiers could uh, be there and hide at the same time. They could look out and hide. But you're absolutely right. And uh, you have the towers, you have the walls, you have the gateways with the huge wooden doors that actually come down uh, and, of course, no longer do. But during a period, even later on when there was periods of the plague, that is what they would do is that they would shut the doors so that yeah. uh, at the, a certain time of the day, People could not go in and out. You were either in or you were out, you know, and you, you that was it. You know, you yeah. had to make sure you got in by the curfew. You know, that was way before the current confinement, you know, at the same and, time. And, and today it kind of looks like, I mean, if you've been to Carcassonne or to Mont Saint-Michel, it's a little bit like that. It's that sort of vibe inside. It's very touristy, I would say. Now, I know that this year, of course, tourism is down to zero in 2020, and they've actually made 
uh, parking free around Egemort, which is crazy because that used to be a big problem. Uh, but because you have to, uh, I mean, there's very limited parking because you're constrained by the water and by the ramparts. You right. can't drive right. into the city. The only people who can drive into the city are vendors and people who live there who, who have a parking space, pretty much. Exactly. So if you're right. a visitor, you need to find a parking lot outside of the walls. And uh, they, they all, there's one that's free, but all the other ones are, are, you have to pay for. And this year, yeah. they've made them free to hoping to attract French people. So French people are notoriously cheap, and so they don't want to pay for parking. So if you want them to come <laughs> shop in your pretty town, you have to make the parking free, and which is what they've that's done this true. year. Yeah, you know. that's anyway, true. that's but, either, yeah. neither here nor there. I just, right. I but it know, is funny. true that, the, that it is... Uh, it is a, it's totally intact. It's really fascinating to go there. And it is, of course, uh, under on what I would call in the past normal circumstances. It is, of course, rather touristy. But it's, it's really interesting to visit. Everything is oh, yeah. pretty much preserved in its medieval quality. Of course, it's got lots of restaurants. It's got lots of little shops uh, of all kinds. Um, some of the specialties of the area, you know, are, are sold there and everything. Um, but just walking around, uh, you really get the feeling of what it was like. Because one of the things about the, these fortified cities, we're still talking about the real Middle Ages, and at that time pretty much everything was fortified, is that it really, it feels fortified. How do you explain this? It feels really fortified inside. I mean, it's just like you know you're in a closed-in space. I mean, yeah. it's... It's also that it was built up out of nothing. It wasn't something that evolved in any kind of natural way. There was nothing there before San Luis started building, basically, except for this one tower. So it's it's like if you build a little city right in the middle of nowhere, you know, it, it has a very strange feeling to it. And, of course, it's been that way uh, ever since. It became a garrison for, for soldiers after, well after this, this time was over, and... Um, the two towers were, of course, in various different times used uh, to house soldiers, which kind of makes sense when you when you think about it. Yeah, um, it, it's uh, it, it, it's really interesting, you know. And as I mentioned, so Philippe the Bell, his his grandson, he put the Knights Templar in the tower in the 1400s. They they actually built a port close enough to Aigues so that uh, the canal was shortened and that boats could really go out uh, in and out at much, much uh, more easily. And they were, that was done basically to rival both Marseille and Set. Mm. Because uh, uh, Set is very, very ancient. Uh, it, it's been around for a very long time. But the canals were, were built at various times by different kings as a way of getting through all of these kinds of estuaries and marshland and, and lagoons, because yeah. there are lots of lagoons in the area. Um, and, and so that was what it was done. And um, it says, I, I noted down that in the late 1700s, Aigues almost disappeared. Basically, the walls were still there, but there was no more economic activity, basically. The, the kings had built canals taking things out of that area, and so it was. It had, it, gone, it had gone back to being just those people who could survive scrounging around, either fishing or gathering together salt and things like that. Right. And the the salt business is big now. Oh yeah. I yeah. mean, now you have like entire factories, and the, uh, the sel de Camargue is a huge deal in France. It's one of the it, things that you can buy if you come to France. It's a nice thing to take back for as gifts to people. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and and in fact, the the whole thing about the uh, salt goes goes back uh, as far as before even the Roman times, you know. So people were serious. I, uh, something I didn't know about uh, it's associated with Aigues It's really it's a it's a, a serious event that happened actually at the end of the 19th century. It's it's uh, it actually was a huge scandal at the time, but it. As, as I said when I was doing the research on it, it unfortunately has echoes of what's going on in France and in the world today. There was a massacre of Italian workers in 1893. Mm. And this has to do, in fact, with the salt. I don't know what do we, what do we say in English. Do we say salt mines? Because it isn't a mine. This is gathering 
what in French we say is a saline, which is a, a zone where the salt is, by drying out the, the salt, the seawater, you, you gather up the salt right. and it's channeled off. And then, of course, it's purified uh, in these different areas. And, of course, the Camargue is, is the biggest producer of, of salt. There are several other zones, but uh, the, the Camargue is the biggest. So this is really strange. Um, in 1893, after probably over a century of inactivity, there were two big businesses that had started up again in terms of making, collecting, collecting the salt and, of course, you know, which means gathering it and then pre- preparing it for, for sale. And because um, there was a bit of an economic crisis, many, many people were looking for work. But the, the company itself decided to bring in uh, workers from northern Italy who themselves were looking for work because everybody was pretty much starving to death at that time because there was not that much work. And so what happened was they recruited a whole bunch of Italians from very much Genoa in that area, which is, of course, the closest part to, to France. And they were also uh, hiring peasants who were leaving their land uh, to go work there because they could not make, they could not survive just on their land. So there must have been a big drought at the at the same time. Right. And what happened was that the uh, management of this this company, they decided to put together on um, the same groups of teams to go out and collect the salt, French people and Italian people, and. Because there was so much re- so much resentment, because there was so little work, uh, the French and the started fighting with the Italians. Mm. They actually started uh, fighting almost immediately. Uh, it was it, on August sixteenth of eighteen ninety three, and uh, they brought the, the the gendarme, the police came in, and the uh, officials of the company came in and tried to separate them and calm them down. But what happened was that over the next few days, uh, it got so bad uh, that the uh, and more and more people were coming into Aigues and then all of this was in Aigues uh, They were actually coming into Aigues and uh, joining up with the French. Mm. And at one point, the head of the company asked for a police escort to take all of the Italians back to, onto a train to get them out of there, to send them back to Italy because they, they, they couldn't calm people down. Um, mm. And on their way, they were attacked by a huge mob, and there were uh, seven Italians killed and over 50 injured. Wow. And it was considered to be uh, the worst aggression against immigrants in the history of France until the last few years, actually. Yeah, that's terrible. Uh, but it happens. It happened uh, a lot. I mean, it happened against Ju- groups of Jews. It happened against groups of uh, all sorts of pe- immigrants pe- over people from centuries. The, the immigrants. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, now of course in France we have all these immigrants coming from all over, to, trying to either stay here or get to, to England. I don't know. Honestly, if there have ever been those kinds of attacks where that, you know, people were, were killed and, and injured like that before. But it's interesting that it came to be associated, unfortunately, uh, as the most negative episode of the history of, of Aigue Mort. Uh, yeah, there was some of that in, um, in uh, Collioure as well. And yeah. there, it, I think there it was Spanish uh Workers, workers that came in yeah. to work. It was a factory that uh, was making bullets, I think. Anyway, did, uh-huh. anyway, yeah, it's happened. It's happened in a lot of places. That's yeah. So, so, the, so that's basically you know the, the history of Egmore. It's the the ramparts are uh, one uh, one kilometer six hundred, which is exactly a mile, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's a, that means each side is a quarter of a mile. It's 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 square. It's it's really totally square, and it's considered to be one of the most perfect examples of m- military architecture of the 13th 
uh, 14th century yeah. still in existence. Yeah, you know? I think it's a great visit for people with kids. When when we visited, I was with my friend Brenda and her husband and two kids, and the 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 boys really enjoyed seeing the ramparts, and I think they were eight and ten at the time or something like that. And so they really enjoyed seeing the ramparts and running around. And uh, it's it's a really nice place. Also, once when you're in Egemort, I would recommend that you stay uh, inside the walls, obviously. You don't really have a choice anyway. There's, it's not like there's hotels outside of the walls. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and and p- put your car away and then... Enjoy the city. Walking around the city at night is is very pleasant, and then around there you can like in Egemort you can take uh, a boat that will take you on a on a ride around the Camargue. She's beautiful, and it'll stop to uh, for you to see the the wild horses. They're not wild anymore, you know. No, they're not wild anymore. <laughs> they're, right. They are they are very well trained to appear when the tourist boat boat pulls up. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's very right. interesting, uh, but it, but it's it's very pleasant. It's a very pleasant thing to do with kids. You see some beautiful birds. I have some nice photos of of birds. I I couldn't identify them, um, but but I was able to shoot some nice birds. Anyway, it's just a a lovely visit. I wouldn't. I I I think if you stay one or two nights. You've seen it all, right? Would you agree with me there? Oh, I would. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think for me, I think one one. It depends. It depends on whether you're just going to visit Egmore and do that. I've never actually done the, the boat trip, but uh, uh, I wouldn't stay more than that for sure. I mean, right. unless you, if you're just going to visit Egmore and that, you could even just do it one night. You can arrive, have a full day, stay the night, and then do some more the next day, and then you know go out. Just be careful. There's a certain time of the year when you really have to worry about mosquitoes. You really do. Sure, so, sure. There's uh, it, it's a, there's it, mosquitoes uh, and a lot of tourists. <laughs> Yeah, no alligators, just a lot of mosquitoes. No, but no alligators. You'll be safe from the alligators. But I think it's a nice place to go explore around the area. It's very different from the rest of France, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, it's very, it, it is very different. Yeah, you know? they, they have... Uh, did you look into their specialty? Because I don't remember eating or drinking. The only thing I remember about my restaurant experience at Egemort is how annoyed I was because they were trying to charge me 30 euros for a bottle of Rosé Piscine, the exact same bottle I can buy for 5 euros at the store. <laughs> and because I was with a bunch of... Um, well, we were friends. We were speaking English, right? So they just they just assumed we were the tourists, and and they were a little bit surprised when I piped up and just give them heck for, you know, you don't charge thirty euros for a bottle that costs five, maybe ten, maybe fifteen, but that's just outrageous. Anyway, they didn't drop but the price. But you know, like the, so many of the, the places have become very touristy. Carcassonne is like that. Uh, Enfleur in Normandy is is kind of like that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. You, you just you know you just you just have to be just. Watch out for you know, thing. Yeah, it's a little um, bit annoying for those of us who know the prices. I'm like, ah. <laughs> I, I I would love to just add a couple of things about Saint uh, Saint Louis, uh, Louis the Ninth. Um, uh, as I mentioned, he was responsible for uh, several crusades. Of course, he was uh, the initiator and the instigator of the building of Aigues Mortes. Um, it, it is really very interesting because he is, in fact, the only king who really was considered, um, this is from the point of view of the Catholic Church, to be a saint from, from the point of view of his, his, uh, uh, his faith. And interestingly enough, he died in the year 1270, and he was canonized 27 years later, which is rather incredible. Yeah. Uh, so he really is, it's not a nickname, that he is called Saint Louis. He is actually, in no, relation to the yeah. Catholic Church, he is officially really considered to be a saint. He's a saint. And that is partly for his uh, his pious belief, but it's partly because he brought back the crown of thorns, uh, thorns and, of course, had Saint Chapelle built for that, and partly because he took part in so many of these crusades. And it happens that... It was the last one that finally did him in. Uh, he yeah. uh, organized uh, the, the Seventh Crusade, went started in uh, basically.
actually, he left on the Seventh Crusade in 1248. There was a total, uh, the estimation is that altogether there were approximately 25,000 men, and I'm not including the women who sometimes went with them and the material that went with them, 25,000 men and 5,000 horses mm. that left on 38 huge ships and lots of smaller boats from Aigamort to go on this uh, the Seventh Crusade. This is the one that was basically to try and... Uh, fight with the, the ruling powers in, in Egypt. Uh, it is really rather astounding when you think about this. Of course, his wife went with him, all of his brothers and his immediate family. His mother, who was back home taking care of the kingdom, was Blanche de Castile. Uh, she was surrounded by distant cousins, but basically he took everybody with him, which from the point of view of what happens if everybody dies, it's not very good for the kingdom. I mean, No, I'm, you it's know, not. Uh, it's, it's completely irresponsible when you're a king to do it, that. It really is. But, but it is rather astounding. Uh, well, the, he, the, he, he was a weird... Uh, okay, nothing, nothing against religious people, but he was religious in the extreme. He was religious in the extreme, exactly. Yeah. And, and, his, and so was his mother, which is how he got to be that way. And, uh, and so was his wife, uh, uh, even though his mother, when it came to the last crusade, the Eighth Crusade, she actually tried to convince him not to go because he almost didn't survive the Seventh, more out of uh, sickness than out of being injured. I don't think he was ever actually injured. I don't know how much actual fighting he actually did. But uh, he was one of the reasons he went on the Seventh Crusade, and this goes back to even the story of the Crown of Thorns, is that he became very, very, very ill. Uh, nobody knows if it was typhus or something else. I don't know if it would have been typhus. I don't think he would have survived. But he swore that if he survived, that he would do something to praise God. And when he did survive, uh, even though most people expected him to die, he said, okay, I am going to go on a crusade and go back and try and conquer some of this land. Strange Honestly, when you think about it, Egypt was never Christian to begin with. Yeah. You know, or very, I mean, it was Christian a little bit, but it wasn't as if it was the Jerusalem or something like that. So, the the I, I'm not big on military history. It would be interesting to know why he chose to take on the most powerful army in the Middle East at the time, which was the Egyptian army. Uh, uh, they were but, really uh, very imperialistic in their mindset. Uh, you know, they they needed to go conquer places and. Yeah. Christianize them and and just yeah yeah they they definitely did so so he of course he went to Cyprus first which was uh, ruled by one of his cousins it's nice to have your family everywhere kind of you know it's like <laughs> you have a brother here a cousin there you know Sicily Cyprus hey let's make sure we have somebody everywhere you know it's no no problem with landing <laughs> here uh, uh, and and they stayed there they they arrived there in uh, February and they waited till May. Till it was much nicer weather, and uh, gathering their forces and, and enough uh, victuals uh, to to attack. And then it, Cyprus is, of course, very very close to both uh, Lebanon, Israeli coast, and and uh, to Egypt. And it was from there that they actually launched their ships to attack the coast of Egypt. Uh, mm. Bad 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 decision, really bad bad decision. Um, um, yeah. He was uh, he was taken prisoner. They had several battles. They won a couple. They lost a whole bunch. A lot of uh, the the soldiers died, and he was eventually uh, he and his uh, brothers and and some of his knights were taken prisoner. And of course, one of the things that they did in those days, which was I kind of I accept that you know instead of killing them, they ransomed them off. You know, yeah. I mean, this is you know this happened even much later on. So it was up to his wife. Uh, to raise the money for his ransom, which he did in apparently record time. I don't know the, what the equivalent of the amount of money would be today, but she managed uh, to, to gather together the money to have him released. And that is when, because he lost the battles of trying to take over Egypt, he decided as a kind of punishment to himself to go mostly by foot, not completely, but to go from there to Jerusalem wow. to pray. To pray. That was to the pray. point? Just to pray? To, to pray and to, 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 
to to do whatever. I mean, to do to hope that whatever you do when you. I mean, it basically was a pilgrimage, and it was a way of of, of, of punishing himself uh, f- for the fact that he he lost the war. Basically, I mean, he apparently lost the war roundly. I mean, there was no chance of him ever winning. So he made it to uh, Jerusalem. He and his wife and his closest circle. And then got on a ship a little bit later, and from Acre, which is Saint Jean d'Acre, which is still uh, there at the northern tip of Israel, uh, which is a, another medieval walled city, uh, he got on a ship and went back to France. Now he lost this war, he lost this crusade, he lost probably half of the men along the way, and a lot of them died of dysentery of all these things. When he got back to France, he was welcomed as a hero. Wow. And that is because it was a time of an incredible religious fervor. I mean, I really, I think it's the only explanation for it, because he didn't bring back anything. He lost everything, pretty much, except his own life and the life of some of the soldiers. And yet he was really considered to be a hero, partly because he just went out there and tried to take back all of this area for Christianity. So... I think that we could say that it was a period of great religious fervor, this, the whole 13th century, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was really strange. And, and just one last thing about him, and this has to do with something that I, I talk about a lot when I actually do a visit to news, which is something that feels like the distant past, but hopefully will not be in the near future. <laughs> you know? Soon, soon. Uh, you know, it is thanks to St. Louis, to this king, that we now all wear a lot of the color blue. Oh. Uh, and that is because um, in this excessive piety that he had, he had made a, a, a vow after surviving uh, first his sickness and then the crusade that when he got back to France, he would be as humble as the Virgin Mary and in fact, in the history of the western part of Europe, up through, starting with the Romans, the color blue was never worn except by peasants. And the only person uh, that was ever depicted wearing blue was the Virgin Mary. Um, hmm. That was in statues and in painting. Uh, the kings wore purple. Uh, oh. And this is this is the heritage of of the Romans. The Romans for the Romans, the cool colors were red, purple, and black, and a little gold along the way. You know, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, uh, nobody wore blue. It is really interesting. Uh, in Egypt, blue was big. <laughs> in the Middle East, blue was big, uh, but it was not in Western Christian Europe. And what happened was that when Saint Louis came back from the Crusade. He told uh, the people who were responsible, I guess, for making the cloth for him, that he no longer wanted to wear purple. He wanted to wear blue. Hmm. And the story um, of how they found the, the, the pigment for the blue is a whole other story. It's a whole big deal. But what happened was eventually they did find it, and he did start wearing cloth that was blue. And because the king of France started wearing blue, the king's and the royalty of all the other Western European countries also started to wear blue. Mm -hmm. And then the other people under them started to wear blue. And that has come down to us so that now it is, for many people, the color that they like the most. Yeah. So when you you walk into the Sainte-Chapelle, the the ground level is very, very blue. Yeah, it, it has the fleur de lis. It has. It's very, very. It's beautiful. I. I think it's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. beautiful. But that's yeah. that's where who we got it from, huh? Yeah, that's where we get it from. It, yeah. It's really fascinating. I mean, you you know you you would think that you would never think that the history of color is so complicated and attached to something as strange as somebody's piety and things like that. You know. Uh, but anyway, so so it's thanks to Saint Louis that we have that, and it was because of Saint Louis. Uh, basically that the Crusades ended because it was really coming to the end of the period of uh, feudal times and chivalry. And having been defeated so badly in the Seventh Crusade, he tried several years later. He he didn't get back to France until uh, 1254. So when you think about it, it took six years for him to go fight 
go to Jerusalem and then eventually come back. Things were a lot slower in those days, you know. Yeah. And, you know, you didn't get on a 380 to, you know, go from one part of the world <laughs> to the other, you know. So it really took a long time. Um, and, and so what happened was that four years later, he started working up uh, the idea of an Eighth Crusade, crusade, and he did leave on an Eighth Crusade in uh, 1270, and uh, it was during this crusade. He never made it any further than Tunis, which by this time was a place where he could, uh, there was, wasn't was that much hostility. So he was able to go from Sicily, which was governed by one of his cousins, to Tunis, which is really next door to, uh, when you go from Sicily. It's right there. Yeah, yeah. And it was in Tunis uh, where he was thinking that he would start from there and work his way across he, I think, had an obsession with Egypt, if you ask me. But anyway, he, he was planning on organizing his entire army there, and he uh, got sick, like half of his army, and he died there at the age of uh, 56. Mm. And uh, apparently, uh, this is always a little bit strange, but in 2014, um, because he's buried in, in Saint-Denis, of course, and so they tried to do a, an analysis. I don't know how they do this. I mean, they obviously opened up the... the Okay, the the coffin. They wanted to see if they could find out what he died of, and uh, because there were several possibilities, but they think it was from. Um, I'm not sure now if this is the right way to saying it in English because now I've got the French word for it in my mind. Uh, scurvy, which is uh, from lack of vitamin C. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, uh, lots of people died of that. You know. Uh, yeah. Which is kind of strange when you think about That's it, sad, but the. Yeah. Um, Eat an orange you know. once in a while. <laughs> yeah, and of course in Tunisia, the irony is, of course, Tunisia is filled with oranges, but I guess at the time it was not exactly the same conditions. You yeah, know? Yeah. But, but he was also someone who had survived quite a few illnesses, so the fact that he lived till 56 was probably not so bad anyway. Yeah, you know? yeah I really think that uh, visiting Egmort would, would, is a cool thing to do. It's It's a lovely thing to do, but... Then, of course, it's not very far from Montpellier and Set, as you've pointed out. Yes. As a matter of fact, there's even public transportation. You can even take a bus between Montpellier and uh, Aigues-Mortes. So if you were staying in Montpellier, I suppose you could go for the day just just to see the, you know, just to see Aigues-Mortes. Uh, I, I think it's a lovely thing to do. But I, to me, what I remember most from my visit was uh, going on that little boat ride. That um, little boat ride. Yeah, well, it's 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 like a, I don't know. It's a, it has. I was looking at my photos as we as you were talking, and kind of reliving my trip. It's right on this. It's right outside of the doors of uh, of uh, Egmort. And it yeah. just says, bateau promenade en Camargue. So it just says, you know, boat ride on the Camargue. And it was really fun. I, I really have fond memories of that. And I oh, asked yeah. you about the food, but then I didn't let you answer it. Do, do you know about the local foods? No, I don't. Okay. Yeah, they probably have the les, les tuiles de set or whatever, you know, the... the well, that, that I know. I mean, I, I, yeah. I know more about the food and set. I, I, I was thinking that I don't know if we've ever done a, a podcast about set. We should. We know. did. Uh, we, I think we did. We think we did a full episode about set at one I think we did. Point. I'm not sure. But, I mean, that whole area is, it's, is it's really very uh, nice. fascinating. You know, yeah. it's, 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 and you say, as you say, it's, it's unique in terms of its... Um, uh, landscape and geology yeah. in, in France. You know, there there are other big rivers and canals and things like that, but there's no big marshland except in, in the area of the Camargue. Yeah, and they're also well known for their rice production, which we right. haven't mentioned, but no. um, it's it's rice, folks. <laughs> it's, yeah. So, so it costs more than normal rice, so I had to buy some just to try it. Yeah, it's rice. Uh, <laughs> it's right. It, it's very. It's it's actually considered to be very good rice. It's they good rice. Kinds, it's know? it's good rice, but it's just rice. So it's yeah. right. I yeah. mean, when you think about it, the um, uh, it, it's unusual. Uh, that's the only zone in France where the climate and the waters. I mean, you need to have marshland to to grow rice. It's like in the Po Valley in Italy, they grow they grow rice too. Mm. You know, um, and so the two big products of the Camargue are rice and salt. Yeah. 
and uh, and and the horses are kind of cool too you know right. they they're beautiful they're beautiful and they they do i mean we'll we'll do an episode about the camargue at some point where we'll talk yeah. about the uh, and maybe we'll do camargue with uh, saint marie de la mer cuz Exactly. Would, that would be and nice. some Gita music at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Elise. That was really interesting. Thank you, Annie. And uh, be well. Hopefully, next time we talk in person. Yes, I hope so too. Au revoir. Over. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Join us, no spaces or dashes. My thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Some of you for years now. You are wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Susan M. Burke, Steve Weber, and Bert Michalczyk. Ooh, for, forgive me, Bert. <laughs> I hope I got close. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. Thank you also, Don Goodpaster, for upgrading your patronage to yearly. I'll be sending you a postcard and some show stickers. I went to the post office to mail the postcards and it was closed. Uh, well, I think the lady must be sick because... Uh, anyway, next week. If you're making a recipe from Join Us at the Table, post it on the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook. It's very fun to see those uh, photos of what you've made and to hear your feedback. So for my personal update this week, uh, I hope you all had a peaceful Thanksgiving. It was really low-key at my house, just my husband and I on uh, Thursday. We did not invite anyone. Our daughter was at school, but she came home for the weekend. So uh, we, we had turkey over the weekend and pumpkin pie and cornbread and all of that good stuff. And I'm also really happy that I can now record interviews over the good old telephone. You know, it's the telephone, it's not great sound, but it's more uniform from a landline anyway. You know, if I could call your cell phone or, or Skype, you could cut in and out. So it'll be lovely to, um, to be able to record from the telephone. So French people have sure taken to walking in nature. <laughs> On Saturdays and Sundays, my walking path feels like I'm walking the Champs-Élysées. There are so many people, and I definitely wear a mask outside when it's that busy. I have to confess that when it's just me and my dogs, I take it off. But when there's that many people around, I definitely wear the mask. I don't know where all these people have been all these years, but I guess if they can't go to sports events and shopping and such, they find other things to do. And walking in nature is, you know, it's nice to see them enjoy an easy walk. And we've had lovely weather in the south of France. Last Sunday, there were lots of birds, lots and lots of birds. It was, you know, you know when there's so many birds that it's loud? <laughs> it was like that. It was great. I also have some news on the pandemic front. President Macron gave a major speech uh, this past week to update us on what's happening with the pandemic in France. To summarize, France has been able to break the growth of the pandemic by going on lockdown a month ago, but we must continue to be extremely cautious. Most stores and services reopened the last Saturday, but not restaurants, not bars, not nightclubs. And of course, because this is France, we had a massive demonstrations all over the country yesterday. It was against a new law being proposed, not passed, but proposed. And it was against a new law being proposed uh, that uh, prohibits filming the police. And you know, I don't know what those massive um, demonstrations are going to do to the pandemic numbers. We'll know in two weeks, but... On this one, I quite agree with the protesters that people should be allowed to film the police. It's just unfortunate that it's happening now during a pandemic. Now, we still have to write ourselves a little permission slip before we leave our houses. I don't do it on paper. There's an app, obviously. <laughs> but we can go further now, 20 kilometers, and uh, be out for three hours for, for sports practice and stuff. So I can resume my normal walk and venture out oh, into the next village. <laughs> it's three kilometers away from mine, so I wasn't technically supposed to be there. Now I can go again.
But now we have a nationwide curfew between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m., except on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. So no partying at friends' houses at night. Yeah, that's kind of a given. Uh, Macron also said that vaccinations will start as soon as possible, probably late December or early January. It will depend on when vaccines are approved. Getting the vaccine will not be mandatory. People over 65 and folks with a known risk factor will get priority for the vaccines and family doctors will be deciding how all of this goes. When can restaurants and gym reopen? Well, that's probably not until late January at the earliest. Uh, They are setting a date. They would like the rate of infection to be much lower. They're talking below 5,000 new infections per day for a whole month. And we're not there. Right yesterday, the the, the last few days, it's been around 12,000 new cases every day. Uh, There are ups and downs, obviously, but overall, the trend is going down, but still, there's ups and downs. But we are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel, not because French people have been exemplary at staying home, but because of vaccines. And honestly, I, I hope this doesn't make me sound like a crazy person, but we cannot all stay home. You know, I can stay home because I work from home and I have a, you know, a comfortable situation, but we cannot all stay home. We have to be understanding of what's happening in real life for other people. Lots of people have to go to work. They have to physically be at work. And for kids, I feel so sorry for people who have young kids because the kids aren't developing normally. Like this is not normal to be home all the time. Um, and I know some parents are very good at, uh, at, uh, homeschooling, but most parents, especially when they have to hold down a job at the same time, it's just so hard. I, I really, uh, have a lot of sympathy and empathy for, for them. Uh, so that's, that's what's happening in France. It's overall pretty good, but, uh, we're not, it's, it's not over yet. And the only bright light at the end of the tunnel is really from the vaccines. So let's keep hoping for those. All right. Well, this was a long episode, so I'm going to get out of here. If you enjoy the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. We're on everything. Podcast app, Spotify, Amazon Music, you name it, we're there. (laughs) Next week on the podcast, an episode with a lady, Suzanne, who bought a house in Provence. Hmm. I just want to keep us all dreaming. (laughs) Send questions or feedback to Annie at JournalistInFrance.com. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France travel podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2020 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. (laughs) 